But Bishop Spung has a third objection. He says, what about all the inconsistencies in the narratives? Well, as I said in my first speech, no historian just throws out a source because it has inconsistencies. Indeed, the very task of the critical historian is to sift his sources to distinguish the historical from the unhistorical. And so looking for inconsistencies is just too blunt a tool to be of much value in analyzing one's sources. It's like trying to do brain surgery with a machete. Moreover, the inconsistencies that Bishop Spong is talking about aren't within a single source. They're between independent sources. But obviously, it doesn't follow from an inconsistency between independent sources that both of the sources are wrong. At worst, it only follows that one is wrong if they cannot be harmonized. Now, I think that most of the inconsistencies he mentioned can be harmonized. They're all answers to all of these. But I don't have time in this speech, obviously, to deal with them. Let me simply point out that the gospel accounts are uh, unanimous and harmonious in their historical core, which is what I'm arguing for tonight. The discrepancies occur in the secondary details. All four Gospels agree on the following facts. That Jesus of Nazareth was crucified in Jerusalem by Roman authority at the time of the Passover feast, having been arrested and convicted on charges of blasphemy by the Jewish Sanhedrin and then slandered before the Roman governor Pilate on charges of treason. He died within a few hours and was buried Friday afternoon by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb, which was then sealed with a stone. Certain women followers of Jesus, including Mary Magdalene, having observed his interment, visited his tomb early on Sunday morning, only to find it empty. Thereafter, Jesus appeared alive from the dead to the disciples, including Peter, who then became proclaimers of the message of his resurrection. Now, all four Gospels agree on those facts. Many more details could be added if you uh, include, in addition to that, facts which are attested by three out of the four. The historian Michael Grant concludes, true, the discovery of the empty tomb is narrated differently by the different Gospels. But if we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources, then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty.